So the bad news is, is that uh, even though we've been trying to work on the assignment and study and master factory, we have to move on to the next lesson. Hoping you understood factoring, but the good news though is if you feel you need more practice with factoring. The majority of what we do today is going to be the exact same thing. We're just going in a selection ranking that we were already working on. Can you come and look at the heading? That's the difference. What are you going to see today that you did not see? An equal sign. Thanks, Hiram. Um, because you see an equal sign and you have an equation, what are you going to be trying to do that you were not trying to do last week? Go ahead, Hiram. Good. When you see an equal sign, by the time you're done, you should be able to state what that unknown number was that was part of the equation before. We solve for the variable. Well, the tricky thing is, because right, you've done this before, you have already solved the equations before, but what you haven't solved are quadratic equations. I'm right. somewhat surprised that you think I inherited vocabulary wise what that word means. So luckily I told you a few times what does quadratic mean, Hiram? Uh, it's four step problem. Oh. <laughs> um, I think about it last week. Probably you mentioned it also before you had a test on polynomials. Yeah. Jeez, it's funny that you keep on saying four. Where would you be getting four from? Quad, okay, yeah, quad. What ratio? Uh, does anybody have a background with Spanish? Uh, yeah. If we said cuadrado, what is a cuadrado? A square. It is a square. Okay, the, 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 the polygon, of, so that is a square, does have four sides. But is that the only instance that you've ever heard the word square used in math when you're dealing with a polygon? Oh, Okay, you can say when you multiply something by itself, or what some crazy kids would say is when you take a number to the second power. That's what square means, second power. Quadratic means second power. Talked about it last week, I'll say it again, and then we'll see if you retain it again later on. Quadratic, second power. So what's going to be being taken to that second power? The variable that you're trying to solve for will be taken to the second power. Well, that causes some issues that you have to deal with. These are not going to be like the equations that we've solved before, which are linear, which the variable is being taken to the first power. We have a variety of methods that we can use to tackle this, of which today, in this one, we're going to be tackling one of them, which is factory. We're going to use that skill that we learned last week in order to solve a quadratic equation. After you... Uh, Tomorrow, sadly, there's no school, but you'll spend all day studying and working on your assignment. Then Wednesday, you'll take a practice test when you come back. Thursday, we'll go over the practice test. Friday, you'll take the real test. Then next week, we're going to go into other methods that can be used to solve quadratic equations. But today and this week, is just factory. So let's look at it step by step. I'm giving you a step by step approach. What's the first step? Yes, Hiram. Set, set the equation equal to zero. How many sides does an equation have? Two. If I get all the terms and I put them on one of the sides, what's left on the other side? So now you're going to get all the terms on that one side. And as long as you've simplified, as long as there's no parentheses, as long as uh, there's no like terms, now we're going to try to factor. This is where it'll look identical to what we did last week. If you understood from the stuff from last week, today's easy. If you didn't understand, like basically the point I'm trying to tell you, you you're probably not going to struggle on step one, step three, and step four. One, step three, step four. Yeah. Okay. What's going to cause you trouble is the same stuff that caused you trouble last week, which is factoring. And it's saying if you don't go home and practice, I can teach this for another three weeks, and it's still going to cause you trouble because it just takes repetition and repetition and going over and going over and going over. So 
anyways. Once you factor, which would involve any one of the factoring techniques we learned last week, greatest common factor, difference of squares, perfect square trinomial, factor chart, whichever way you factor, you're going to set each factor equal to zero. What you're doing when you do this is using something called zero product property. What's a variable? Because we're trying to solve for the variable, right? Okay, it's an unknown number. It's a number that is presently not known. So we're trying to use our investigatory skills. It's not even a word. It's not investigator. Um, I just don't want you to learn bad grammar. Uh, we're going to investigate and put on our detective cap so we can solve the mystery of the unknown number, okay? But when you have that unknown number being squared, which is what quadratic means, um, it's not as straightforward as just isolating. When you when you were taught to solve for a variable, just say, hey, get it by itself and I would know what it is. And yeah, that's what we're still trying to accomplish, but that square makes it more difficult to accomplish. So here's the way factoring works, right? When you make each factor equal to zero, what? Once I have a list of factors, like last week when we factored, what symbol did you see at the end that you didn't see at the beginning? X. What symbol did you see at parentheses. the end? Parentheses. And what do we use parentheses for in algebra? Multiplication. Multiplication. So we would get an expression and we basically change it to multiplication. So even though we don't know what the number is that we're looking for, by setting it up this way, we know that we would be multiplying because it's already been factored. We'd be multiplying, and after we multiply, we would end up with zero. Well, whether I'm multiplying two numbers, three numbers, five numbers, ten numbers, a hundred numbers, regardless of how many numbers I'm multiplying, if I multiply a series of numbers and I end up with zero, even if I don't know what the number is, what do I know about the numbers? What's the only way you can multiply numbers that end up with zero? I multiply by zero. Say it better. Say it better. Multiply by itself. If you use the zero product property, distribute by zero. Divide by zero. Square it by zero. Muhammad, what's one times two? Two. Okay, what's two times three? Okay, what's six times four? Okay, what's twenty-four times five? It's 120. What's so what's 120 times 6 is 720? What's 720 times 7? We can just keep on going and going and going. Yeah, we're going. Let's get into the billions, right? And then I go times zero. Bam! What's gonna happen? Oh jeez. So even if I would have given you a list of numbers that were definitely not zero, if one of those numbers that I happen to multiply happens to be zero, what do I end up with? Zero. That's zero product part. That says that if I have some amount of numbers that I'm multiplying, um, and if I'm going to end up with zero, I don't know which one it's going to be, but one of the numbers has to be zero. And that, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to make each factor equal to zero, and that's what's going to allow us to solve. No, standard form is before you factor. That's when you're in simplest form. Okay. Now, the question that you should have asked Mohammed is, wait. If you're going to make each factor, each individual factor equal to zero, does that mean that we can get more than one solution? And then, yeah, the answer to that is, yeah, you're going to get more than one answer. Specifically, okay, again, when I say quadratic, what does quadratic mean? Uh, second power. Second, second power, power, right? So eventually you'll learn something called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that when you have an equation where the variable is being taken to an exponent, that exponent is the maximum number of solutions that that equation can have. So if I had like x being taken to the fifth power, I could not have more than five solutions. Does that mean that I'm going to have five solutions? Well, yeah, like once you start getting into imaginary solutions, yes, you have to get five solutions. But as far as real solutions go, because Algebra 1 deals exclusively with the, the real number line, um, it means that you can have five or less. You can have five solutions, you can have four solutions, you can have three, you can have two. If I have a quadratic, which the biggest exponent is two, I can have two solutions. That's going to be very common. That'll probably be the most common. Is you're going to have two solutions. You definitely can't have four solutions. You 
Can't have three. If I said two or less, it could be two solutions, one solution, or or no solution. Those are what you're gonna have. So let's start the solving party and invite all of our solving friends. What does the first step say to do? What can you tell me about that step? It's already done for you. Good. Um, okay, so you're right. It's done. So let's move on to the next step. Okay. So far, you guys are doing okay. It seems that more of you are paying attention than the other ones are. So my other classes today haven't gone so great, right? So I'm just trying to help you out. And I've done this enough to know what, like, the mistakes are, which just mistakes just should never happen. You're going to get a test on Friday. The test is going to have directions, but the kids have to see directions. So it's like, they're in class, they're somewhat paying attention, they're not paying attention, and they don't know the difference between this that you see in front of you and this. They look very similar, but what's the difference? One has an equal sign, and one doesn't. So when the equal sign is there, yeah, that's an equation, and it's going to tell you to solve. And on this test, you're only going to know one solving method, which is going to be by factoring. Okay? Now, on the other ones where you don't see the equal sign, yeah, those are not going to say to solve, but you guys don't read the directions. I wish you read the directions, but you guys just don't read the directions. Those are going to just be factored. The problems that can factor, like this is an expression, it cannot be solved. You would just factor. But what happens is kids see this, and they just decide to put in their own equal sign when there was, when there was ever one there to begin with. Yeah, so let's make sure we know the problem. Okay, so the first step is making good zero, but that's already been done for us. What's the next step? Okay, so two terms. What do we try first with two terms? Caleb, do we have a greatest common factor here? Well, Jasmine, do we have a factor here? Quadratic. There's no more exponents in there. So I'm just going to factor it. Don't divide it by two. What does the next step say to do? Set each factor equal to zero. Well, that presents enough for another issue. When all of the factors are in parentheses, yeah, it's real simple because you just put each parentheses equal to zero. But here we have factors outside of the parentheses. I'm always unsure of which way to take this because really the way it's supposed to be, what are we solving for? What are we solving for? In any equation, what do you solve for? A variable. When you have a variable that's on the outside, it doesn't matter what number is in front of it. That, that number that's in front of it, the two that you change it, it's not going to do anything. So really, you would probably see what he just do is just say x equals two. But then if I do that, they, wait, but I don't get it. Where'd you get that from? Or a, a, a variation of that. But for what happened to the two, I don't get it. So the good news is if you don't understand that, well, then go ahead and write it. It, it, the, the point is you have to know what factors are. Factors are numbers that you multiply. Really, what am I multiplying here? I'm multiplying two times x times this three x plus two. And if I just said, those are factors. Two is a factor, x is a factor. 3x plus 2 is a factor. So if you make each one equal to 0, well, no matter how hard the 2 wants to be, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. No, the 2 will never be 0. That's why the 2 is irrelevant. But what is are the, are the other two. But fine. Like, let's say you still don't get that. It's just that you have a lot of people that just want to leave the 2 together with the x. Fine. Be my guest. Go ahead. Leave the 2 with the x. 2x can be 0, and 3x plus 2 can be 0. And now we solve. What were the maximum amount of solutions we said we could have? 2. And let's say we're going to get that. How would I solve the first one? Okay. 
Funny story this morning. I had a couple of groups that came to my offer and came in early to try to get into help. Um, and so one of them was a bunch of uh, hey, take out whatever it is you want to work on. And if I didn't get the one with the flashlights. Well, first off, the person was trying to work on me, which we haven't even got to solve yet, but that's fine. I have some students that I've done this before. Maybe they're a little advanced, or maybe they have a little more interest in Even though I haven't officially covered it in class, you know, they make an effort to try. So that's not really the big issue. But the problem was, there's no fractions. You want to know what the fractions were this person was referring to? No, it wasn't the answers and the multiple choice. If it wouldn't have been multiple choice, there wouldn't have been a fraction anywhere. So how could you say you're having trouble with the fractions? You're not even dealing with the fractions. The fractions are a byproduct. Like, it's not the problem itself. It's just what comes afterwards. And, and the reason for those fractions were because something like this, where if I solve it, Not, not, and not, not to mention this, that this person had answers on half of their uh, half of their worksheet without an answer without one piece of work. Yeah, th this is not a fraction problem. And I'm the first one to tell you. You've heard me say it before. Like, oh, what do the kids not like about this problem? And you, oh, the fractions. No fractions. No, no. That's at the end. I ended up with a fraction. But how many solutions did I end up with? Two. I did end up with two. Well. Anytime you end up with more than one solution, you should be writing what's called a solution set. You might have seen some weird looking things that are on the worksheets. What a solution set is, is a set of solutions more than one. You write the variable, which in this case is x, you write a colon. And now do not get this confused with an ordered pair. This has nothing to do with x and y. The actual order doesn't even matter. It's just saying, hey, I have more than one solution. You don't even write parentheses. It's just that's like an elephant. And then you just write your two solutions, which is zero and negative two over three. Go oh, away, Mr. Romero. How about if I would have written negative two over three and then zero? It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's just saying that the solution is zero. Brackets. Brackets. Um, not, not with me. That's a bracket. That's a bracket. You, you use brackets. Um, you use brackets when you were doing the uh, interval notation, when you were doing domain and range. But you didn't use braces for that. Tired, you miss a string to the sweater? No. Okay, here's another quadratic equation, Ariana. What should we do first? Good. I don't like the first example. This has not been done for us, so we have to do it. I even paraphrase it for you when you make an equation equal to zero. And it's what are you really doing? I even put it in parentheses for you. You're putting all the terms on one side. How many terms does this equation have? It does have three. I need to put them all on one side. Now, the concept of moving terms from one side to the other, that is not a novel concept. That's something that should not be due to you. Um, but there are some considerations that you have to take that you didn't take before. How many sides does this equation have? Two sides. A left side and a right side of an equal sign. Sides. You can see people like draw on the wall. How many sides? There's two. There's a left side and a right side. And yes, it is true 
that the equal sign means that both of those sides are the same. But considering the method that we're eventually going to use, which is factoring, in order for factoring to be successful, whatever number is in front of the square needs to be positive. So, yeah, I can put whatever side I want, but if I were to send this x squared over to the right side, what would that number in front become? It'd become a negative. I don't want that. So, and that has kind of decided for me that I want to leave everything on the left. Not because there's more terms there. It has nothing to do with how many terms. It's because I want the number in front of the square to be positive. Okay, you told me I started with three terms. I'm going to go minus 9x and minus 9x. This cancels out. How many terms do I still have? Three. I still have three. Speaking of uh, Muhammad said an interesting word earlier, he said standard form. And that's another thing I'm kind of surprised about because at the last school was that I was stressing that from the very beginning of the year, saying like, what is standard form? What is standard form? But I haven't seen a lot of kids know what that is. And, and if you don't know what standard form is, you're not going to do the factor. Standard form means go from biggest exponent to least, not biggest number, biggest exponent. So, look, I have three terms in it that are like, but the order that I have is important. The first one that should be written is the square. The next one that should be written is the x to the first power, which is a negative and an x. And then from the square, they keep that. That's called standard form. So you said that we needed to make it equal to zero, or we just made it equal to zero. Sebastian, what comes next? Good. So, okay. Well, factoring, it depends on number of terms. Andrew, how many terms do we have? So what do we look for first with three terms? Thank you. Yeah, we do look for greatest common factor. So Ariana, do we have a greatest common factor? Oh, just one. Don't say my copy divided by anything other than one. Right? What do we look for next? You know, that, you know that last period, I actually have a pretty good students in there now over us because we come up with four. I believe you. So, yeah, we do want to look for a perfect square trinomial. Right? So, Mohammed, maybe then you can help us out. Can you tell me um, why this can or cannot be a perfect square trinomial? Tell me, is it or isn't it? And then why or why not? Tell me part of it. Morgan? Why not? Bellissimo. Yeah, very good. Yes, Mohammed did notice that the first and last term are positive, which that is a requirement. But since 18 is not a perfect square, I don't even have to waste my time doing a test. And then I'm going to move on to the factor chart. The factor chart doesn't have to work? No, not really. But, but if it doesn't work here, then what's the point of giving this to you in a lesson on factoring? Like, it doesn't have to work. If it's not working for you, you can do this on your own. Anytime C is 18, B is negative 9. Even though, yes, I will admit that you got the worst part of the deal, um, it shouldn't be as hard as you think it is, which is the deal we made was you guys take care of your time tables, I'll take care of your time tables. So I'm not going to worry about the signs yet because Papa Romero is going to take care of you. I'm just going to write all the numbers I can think of that multiply to 18, 1, 18, 2, and 9, 2, and 3. Because in the first column is A times C, and the second column is going to be Excuse me. So then, after you can take care of your times tables and multiplication, then I gave you a table with all the signs for you to study. It says the first column is positive, the second column is negative. What do I know about my factors? It will be negative. Do any of those add up to give me negative nine? Negative three and negative two. Well, are we done? No, we're not even done factoring yet. But this is still what we did last week. If you really want to start we can start with Mohammed, you would have, when you're done with the chart, you would have had this thing that comes over you of 
satisfaction when you realize that the beat is one. It just saves you some trouble. When A is one and A starts, I can now just write two parentheses. Then I write the variable, one of the numbers that I got from the chart, the variable, one of the numbers that I got from the chart. But then don't forget, this was an equation. This, this, this step right here is where all the mistakes happen. People put equals zero when there's no equal zero that's supposed to be there. People forget the equal zero when it is supposed to be there. This was an equation, so it's going to be equal to zero. Now I'm going to go back here. What's the next step? Set each factor equal to zero. There are two. When I have two numbers, here's a number and here's a number. And I multiply those numbers, and I get zero, because that's what this parentheses means, I multiply. I don't know what those numbers are, but I know that one of them has to be zero. If either one of those parentheses gave me a zero, I would end up with zero. So I account for that by making each one equal to zero. It doesn't mean that x is zero. It means that x minus 3 can be zero, or x minus 6 can be zero. How many solutions do I have? I do have two. Um, so what should I write? I have more than one solution. If only I had a name, so I'd make it easier to refer to. Like when you have more than one solution, you have to like write this like set of solutions. And oh, that's right. It's called the solution set. If I wrote six on the three, would be wrong? Yes. No, we would not. Any questions? Charles, what's good about this one? When you first look at when you first look at this, what do you like? If we like things being done for us. Morgan Town. Huh? Yeah, we already have it equal to zero, so that's one last step we have to do. This is the second step we need to do. Factor, let's go to that side where all the terms are at, and let's see if that side can be factored. How many terms are on the side where everything's at? Three. What are we looking at? You have a question or an answer? You just like having your hand up. I feel you. Um, what do we look for first with three terms? Do we look, okay, Hiram, so do those three terms have a greatest common factor? Maybe. Kayla? Do we have a greatest common factor? These two have a factor in common, but not that one. This. Angel, anything common? Yeah, go ahead, Hiram. No, 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 it's just a one. <laughs> yeah, we have a one for that. But what, what are we supposed to check for next? Perfect squares, perfect squares, final answer. It doesn't hardly ever work, but if it does, you save yourself the chart. 
So can this be a perfect choice out of the room? Yes, possibly. Big question marks over here. First and last term are positive. First and last term are perfect. So that doesn't mean that it is, but it means that we should check. So the way that we check A, B, C, or what it want to be, the full rules of formula. Exactly, but you can make progress. You're very, very close. Yeah. This allows us to do is to bypass a chart, but the good news is if you wouldn't realize it on the chart anyways, you could still get the right answer. But um, now we can come back to about the formula. The formula for um, a perfect square trinomial was one parentheses with a square on the outside. Borrow the sign from the middle, which is negative. And take the square root of those perfect squares. What's the square root of that? X, what's the square root of 25? X. And then don't forget it would be How many X's do you see? Yeah, it's just one. But now see that this still counts as two because this square really means that this was X minus 5 and X minus 5. And if you would have done the chart, you actually would have probably written X minus 5 and X minus 5. But the, the thing is, it's repeated. So when you go and make this equal to zero, if I say x minus 5 equals 0 on the left side of the screen, and then I say x minus 5 equals 0 on the right side of the screen, am I going to get a different solution each time? It's the same thing. But when you have a repeated factor, the square really just cancels out. And if you're not sure why, um, a square root cancels the square. Uh, just so that you know, next week you're going to learn some extra rules that apply with square root when you take a square root. So when you take a square root of zero, you can really ignore those rules. So it's not a big deal. The square cancels out. So you just get x minus 5 equals 0. Plus 5 plus 5. Equals 5. Very good. That was my next question. Because I not because it's a two, but because I only have one solution, do I have to write a solution set? No. no. Can I write a solution set? Yeah, you could, but you just write the five ones. Kristen, you got that? Yeah. There's a formula that I gave you last week on the factoring notes that said when you have a perfect square trinomial, I can rewrite it this way if I wanted to. It's like I literally drew arrows for you. You keep the sign in the middle, it's one parentheses, then you take the square root of the first, you take the square root of the second. You put that there. If you go back and watch the video, you see I did that last week too. Um, because we're short on time and I want to try to get like every type of problem in, let's get to the last one now. Yeah. 
with that, what's good about this problem here? Just at first sight, what do we like about it? It's already equal to zero, that's good. Elena, um, what are we supposed to do after it's equal to zero? What I see a lot of here is that people that don't like factoring just go, oh yeah, that means that 25 x squared equals zero and 16 equals zero. No, of course not. You have to factor. That's factoring. Well, factoring depends on how many terms. How many terms do we have? Here? We have two terms. What do we try first with two terms? GCF. Okay, good. Do I have a GCF here? No, no. What's the only other way that we know how to factor two terms? How can I be a versor trinomial if there's only two terms? So what the notes that you guys haven't looked at in three days? Yes, those notes. Why are you jumping to conclusions, Mr. Romero? Just because we don't remember things right away doesn't mean we haven't studied. That's what I said. Yeah, I think this last year and I felt this year. There you go, difference of squares. Thank you. So what do the difference of squares mean? Well, that means that if I, I already have a difference, which is good, but I think I'd be in trouble. If I can rewrite this as a difference of two squares, then I can factor. If not, I can't. Those squares would have to be perfect squares. So, can, uh, what is the square root of 25x squared? 5x. 5x. 5x minus 5x is 25x squared. What is the square root of 16? 4. Oh, it's the full thing, 6. And now here's one of, the, one of those paying attention questions. I have now confirmed that I do have a difference of squares. I'm doing cartwheels in my mind. You just can't see them. How does a difference of squares look like? Remember how you just asked me for this last one? Oh, but mister, I don't get it. How'd you get that parentheses? Well, because I use a formula. There's a formula for difference of squares, too. What does the formula for difference of squares look like in factor form? What would a difference of squares look like in factor form? No, there, was a, there, was, there was even a word I gave you. And I asked you for the word. And I pronounced it all funny and everything. And so take the 5x, take the flow, take the 5x, take the flow, the plus and the minus of the I have now finished factoring. What comes next? Factoring. Oh, you gotta finish factoring. You solved it. What do I solve? Factor. 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 Factor
okay? I'm trying to give you like, so we've done a perfect square trinomial, we've done a difference of squares, we've done a couple of factor charts. If you can understand all those and understand like something like this, you'll do perfectly. This will be the hardest thing that you might see on Friday. If you don't understand this one, you should be fine. Person, you okay? Can you see? Religion, what's the first step? Daniel, what's the first step? Hey, set the equation equal to zero. How many terms do I have in total? Four. But now, be aware, whatever term you end up on, in order to continue and do factor things, the term all the way down in front needs to be positive. Right now, there's only one term that has a square, and it currently has a positive six. If I were to move that to the right side, what would happen to the six? And I don't want that, that's, that's going to cause issues with factor. So, what side should everything end up on? But wait, but Mr. Romero, does that mean that we should always go to the left side? No, just whatever. Whatever side we want. I started with four terms, I'm going to go minus 10d, minus 35. Minus 10d, minus 35. Cancel out. Minus 10d, and then add together any number. Doing one together. I'm just moving. How many terms did I start with? Four. Four. How many terms do I currently have? No, I currently still have four because I haven't combined any of them. Very good. Well, then Mohammed is thinking ahead of the game and realizing that two of those four terms are right. So before I write them in standard form, I'm going to combine them. I'm doing the hood. No, no, no. What did they combine? I'm going to do this. Yes, sir. Very okay. Well, my next question was going to be, what do you do next? You say factor. Then I say yes. Then I say, what comes first in factoring? And Morgan said GCF. And you are correct. There is no GCF, mm -hmm. and that is what makes this kind of a pain in the butt because. <laughs> That guy right there. When the lead is not one, sometimes you get lucky, and there is a GCF that ends up being the same as the lead. So when you divide it out, what's anything divided by itself? One. So eventually, even though you might not have a one to begin with, you end up with a one in front. Life gets easier because once you finish with the chart, you go straight to factor form. But that's not the case here. Now, somebody also said that this is not a perfect square trinomial. Why not? Because the 35 is negative. You can say 35 is not perfect. You can say 6 is not perfect. So, we're going to end up doing the biggest chart that we've done to date. I remember the, remember the whole thing in the hood? Yeah, you're, you're definitely not from that hood. I don't understand. When you combine like terms, 21 minus 10. Oh, minus 10. Yeah, yeah. Combining like terms. Yeah, sadly, you guys are going to be responsible for the multiplication part, but luckily you have a calculator, even if it takes you longer. Um, basically, yeah. I don't have to, because I have good mental math skills, but yes, you might have to, yes. Also because I'm very cool. 74 is all 5 and 42, 6 and 35, 7 and 30, 8 Those are all the combos I'm going to try to give you 210. When the left column is negative and the right column is positive, how do I adjust my factors? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
small negative, big positive, negative, 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 negative. Do any of those give me that 11 that Hiram was looking for? Negative 10 plus 21 is indeed 11. Ding, 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 ding. Yay, Hiram. But this ugly six is ugly right again. Seven, six. All right, so let's look at the adjustments. Good news is, anytime you do a chart, you're still going to have two binomials. This will be the equation, and it will be equal to zero, it's still equal to zero. The numbers that you got from the chart are still going to go second. But if you remember, I did actually do one like this last week. The difference is what goes in the front. Because of that A, I'm not going to just put the variable, which was D. I'm not going to just put the D. I also have to put A in front. What was A? I'm going to put the 6. And then besides that, before I can continue, I'm still not done factoring. If those individual factors still have a common factor, it has to be divided out and thrown away. Meaning, can 6 and 10 be divided by the same number? Can 6 and 10 be divided by the same number? No. 2. Yes, 2. Can 6 and 21 be divided by the same number? 2. No. Nothing. Zero. 3. So this gives you 3D minus 10. This gives you 2D plus 7. And now I can continue. What comes after factoring? Oh, my God. It's okay. Each of the square channel. Make each factor equal to zero. 3D. Oh, no, I messed up. It's not 3D. Sorry. 3D minus 5. So 3D minus 5 equals zero. 2D plus 7 equals zero. Plus 5 plus 5. 3D equals 5. Here are those fractions that people said that we were confusing them yet. They had nothing to do with the problem until the very end. Then minus 7 minus 7, 2d is equal to negative 7 divided by 2. Yeah. There are two solutions, so I would write both of them in the solution set. Each can either be 5 over 3, or it can be negative 2 over 2. We'll do one more before we leave. You, you guys get the cherry on the top here. Ooh, our favorites. Now let's do this because I don't really have the word in here. Let's change this conservatory garden to say rectangular garden. Because that's what we're intending. That's another word. The length of a Charlotte, North Carolina rectangular garden is 20 yards greater than its width, and the area is 300 square yards. What are the dimensions? The great thing about this problem is that it mixes what we're doing now, quadratics, and it mixes, with, it, mixes it with system. Ah. Look at the question. What are we looking for? The dimension. If this is a rectangle, what are the dimensions of a rectangle called? What are the dimensions of a rectangle called? Length and width. Now, this has area in it. They tell you that the area is 300 yards. Normally, what's the area of a rectangle? Length times width. So they give me the area, and they tell me the area is 300. So 300 equals length times width. They also give me an extra equation that says that the length is 20 yards greater than the width. So the length is the width plus 20. So notice how I have two unknowns. I wrote two equations, so this is like a system. 
if this were a system a week ago where you took a test, how would you solve that system? has to be equal to zero because I have to put all the terms on one side because of the W T squared. So I've got this will be the W squared plus 20 W minus 300. This does not have a GCF. It cannot be a perfect square triangle because of the negative 300. So let's put chart A is 1, B is 20, C is negative 300. For the first part. So, negative 300, good, and then 20. So let's think of all the combos. 1 and 300, 2 and 150, 3 and 100, uh, 4 and yes, 75, 5 and 60, 6 and 50, 6 and no, 8 no, 9 no, 10 and 30. No. Um, 12 and 25, 14, no. Well, anyways, long story short, when you have a negative and then a positive, it should be small negative, big positive.